And before we start, I would like to introduce and invite our interpreters uh, to introduce themselves. Uh, I will start with the Spanish interpreter. Good evening. My name is Emily Getchell, and I will be your Spanish interpreter this evening. Buenas noches a todo el mundo y bienvenidos. Mi nombre es Emily. Voy a servir de intérprete en español. En un momentico, vamos a encender la función de español. Si desea escuchar la reunión en español, puede ubicarse al fondo de su ventana de Zoom y ahí hacer clic en el icono del globo, escogiendo español. Um, si se está conectando con móvil, empuje los tres puntitos y de ahí escoge Interpretation, pues Spanish, pues Done. Y si tiene cualquier problema técnico, por favor comuníquese con nosotros en el chat. Muchas gracias. I will now pass it to Khmer. Good evening. This is Vesna Loic. I'm the Khmer interpreter for tonight's meeting. បានជំរាបសួរបងប្អូនខ្មែរទាំងអស់ដែលបានមានឱកាសមកចូលរួមក្នុងកិច្ចប្រជុំយប់នេះពេលដែលបងប្អូនចូលមកបងប្អូនអ
All questions and comments are welcome and appreciated. However, we do request that you refrain from any disrespectful comments. Notice of MassDOT's policy on diversity and civil rights. All MassDOT's activities, including public meetings, are free of discrimination. MassDOT complies with all federal and state civil rights requirements preventing discrimination based on sex, race, color, ancestry, national origin, religion, creed, gender, sexual orientation, gender identity, or expression, or veteran status. We welcome the diversity from across our enter entire service area. If you have any questions or concerns, please visit the following site to reach the Office of Diversity and Civil Rights. Thank you for joining our meeting and we, are pre and we appreciate your participation. Thank you, Roy. Uh, this is the second public information meeting that we've had on this project. The last one was uh, in December of 2020, just about two years ago. Um, so we'll give a uh, little recap and updates as to where we are. And then the, the meat of the hearing, we'll be talking about bicycle and pedestrian accommodation. Uh, we're certainly going to make it better than what's out there now with the existing bridge. We'll talk about landscape design concepts that we have as we go forward with the design. A little bit about the bridge structure, uh, bridge aesthetics. We'll talk about those and then bridge lighting, both the safety and security lighting and then underneath architectural lighting. Then I'll give an update as to the cost and schedule and where we are. Uh, there is a Q&A at the end. Again, we'll do the best that we can to respond to your comments and then we'll adjourn. Next slide, please. Next slide. So uh, this is a bridge replacement to replace the temporary bridge that was built in 1983. The new bridge will be a little larger, uh, a little wider. It'll be two lanes in each direction. Uh, and we'll get into more details about it in a minute. Our goals are to enhance safety and connectivity for bicycles, pedestrians, emergency vehicles, and watercraft under the bridge. And we want to improve traffic operations and safety uh, at the intersections on either side of the bridge. Next slide, please. So to date, MassDOT took over this project from Northern Middlesex Council of Governments, who prepared um, a planning study. And they suggested that we study three alternative alignments. MassDOT selected a designer, a design team, We've selected an alignment. We'll talk about that tonight. We've selected a bridge type and a configuration of the bridge. We've confirmed that we're going with a four lane roadway cross section. And tonight we'll talk about the bicycle and pedestrian configuration adjacent to the travel lanes. Next slide, please. Now I'd like to ask Dan Barboza uh, to talk about the bike head connections. And we'll have, uh, a few different speakers, and then I'll come back in a few minutes. Thank you. Dan? If, hello, my name is Daniel Barbosa. I am a highway engineer for HNTV, and I will be presenting the proposed bicycle and pedestrian connections for the Rourke Bridge project. At the last working group meeting, we went over what were the most important aspects to the public when it came to crossing the bridge as a bicyclist or pedestrian. To summarize, the key features were, flexibility and path use, which relates to the ability to use the path during various events, such as watching a regatta, separation of bicyclists and pedestrians, simple wayfinding connections, which are easy to read signs that assist in navigating on and off the path, space for furniture lighting and signing, which relates to bullet one and three, as well as for safety, and equal use for northbound and southbound by both pedestrians and bicyclists. Last time we spoke, we had three alternatives for the Rourke Bridge cross section, a bike lane in each direction with sidewalks, a one bi-directional bike lane with sidewalks on each side, and a shared use path on each side. Each cross section option had pros and cons related to use flexibility, commingling between pedestrians and bicyclists and sidewalk buffer space. Next slide, please. After receiving all the previously mentioned feedback, we determined this cross-section as the optimal design moving forward. 
This cross section provides greater path use flexibility as it shares the same width as the previous shared use path option, Separ provides separation between pedestrians and bicyclists, and provides sidewalk buffer space as the proposed buffer is painted. Like the Rourke Bridge cross section, the cross section of Pawtucket Boulevard had alternatives that were discussed. Both alternatives shown provide great connectivity to the proposed Rourke Bridge cross section shown in the previous slide. Upon further analysis, we found that the shared use path, path option provides less of an overall impact in the area. Moving forward with the shared use path alternative, we determined this cross section to be the one that fits the needs of the area the most without impacting environmental features and right of way. Additionally, with less of a pavement structure proposed, there is more of an opportunity for proposed landscape features. And now I will pass it off to the Dean. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. I'm Deneen Crosby. I am with Crosby Schlesinger Small Ridge, and I am the project landscape architect. Um, our bridge is set within the landscape of the Merrimack uh, with recreational parkland, natural riverbanks, wetlands. And in looking at how the bridge meets the landscape and the street system, our goals are to restore the landscape, uh, restore the banks while still maximizing recreational potential provide pedestrian bicycle connections in all directions, improve the open space system and further our environmental goals, and improve opportunities for river use and engagement, thereby increasing the city's vitality. The north and the south sides are quite different. The landscape character of the north side as seen from Pawtucket is of a manicured park to the east of the existing bridge and a wooded area to the west. You can see in the bottom lower two photos to the left of the manicured park and the upper one to the right, the wooded area that is um, to the west of the existing bridge. Next. On the south side, uh, there are public destinations on both sides. There's a charter school to the west and Edward Street Park to the east. The bridge threshold is at busy commercial streets, and most notably on the south side is the railroad, which is a barrier between the business and residential neighborhood and the river itself. And you can see the extent of that railroad in the aerial photograph on the right. Um, the blue line is the railroad that separates um, the city from the river. A summary of opportunities we see. On the north side, there are landscape restoration opportunities at the new bridge threshold and at the old bridge abutment. Uh, connections will be made to the adjoining pathway system to the east and across Pawtucket to the north. And there's an opportunity at the old abutment to allow for a future new place from which the river can be enjoyed. On the south side, there are, uh, go back please. On the south side, there are opportunities to connect the bridge multi-use pathways to the Edward Street Park, to allow for a pathway connection from the charter school to the park. And there may be an opportunity to create a river viewing area at the old abutment. So starting on the north, the three areas we looked at are the old abutment, the multi-use path connection from the new bridge to the east, which curves allowing for planting buffers and stormwater basins, and the design of the landscape where the bridge meets the riverbank area. At the old abutment, one idea is to preserve the existing bridge piers so that the structure of that old bridge can be used to create a new public space from which to view the river. Perhaps there can be a deck built on top of the structure with a slope lawn and pathways from both directions on Pawtucket to a new overlook. The multi-use path at the edge of Pawtucket is curved, which is a nicer ride for recreational bicyclists and also allows us to create more substantial stormwater planters, perhaps linked to a larger basin or planting buffers. The buffer in between the path and Pawtucket varies from four feet to 19 feet, allowing for substantial planting in some locations. 
At the threshold, we're suggesting a small grouping of trees at the entrance at both the north and south sides that are of the same type that mark the entrance to the bridge at the street. We don't have a suggestion yet for what that is, but we think it should be a unique planting that becomes associated with and part of the identity of this bridge. As the bridge rises, we're suggesting that there be a level planted area at the bridge elevation to the sides of the multi-use paths that allow us to plant a grove of trees that you ride by just as you're passing to the river, marking that transition. The planted area could be accessible, it's shown as lawn here, and may provide yet another place for residents to enjoy views of the river, or could just be visible as you ride by. And the banks themselves would be planted with a mix of perennials, shrubs, small trees that are all native to this area. On the south side, we're evaluating the potential of a viewing area at the old abutment, a pathway connection under the new bridge from the school to the park, a connection from the bridge pathway system to the Edward Street Park, and how the bridge meets the existing streets. On this slide, you see the possible locations of pathway connections. Uh, the orange path at the top is from the school to the park. The curving path from the intersection of the bridge and Middlesex is from the bridge pathways to the park. The entrance planting is similar to the north side and we're suggesting an area level with the bridge for tree plantings on the west. There are opportunities for street tree planting on the east side of Wood Street and on the south side of Middlesex. Their, uh, their locations are, approximate location are, are as shown here. A section of Wood Street showing some new tree planting along the east side near the intersection of Middlesex Street. Next. And at Middlesex, there are some opportunities along the south side. There are some existing trees there as well. We'll be coordinating the design of all streetscape elements with any proposed city work. And I'm going to pass on to Sean and Eddie to talk about the design of the bridge. Thank you. Thank you, Denise. My name is Sean St. Hilaire, and I'm a structural engineer with HNTB. Today, I'll start by providing an overview of the proposed bridge configuration, and we'll then hand it over to Eddie and Domingo to discuss some of the more interesting architectural and lighting elements that have been in development. The bridge type and layout developed to date evolved from the considerations taken of the site, the functionality of the bridge, and community feedback received from meetings like this to help identify important features, activities, and path connections. Some of these critical metrics include supporting the wider roadway and shared use path, which Dan just went through in detail, creating areas for placemaking to enjoy open views of the river and surroundings while also being mindful of the overall aesthetic of the bridge as it's seen from the river and shoreline, and maximizing clearances over the river for recreational activities on the water, uh, be it boating, kayaking, or one of the signature regatta rowing events. With these considerations, we've identified that a steel plate girder bridge type founded on concrete piers and abutments provided the efficiency and flexibility and functionality desired and needed for the Rourke Bridge. From the top side, the structure is capable of supporting a much larger 84 foot wide bridge, which for reference is approximately three times wider than the existing 27 foot wide bridge in place today. It allows for expansive views of the river from the shared use path and the opportunity to provide further views from the multiple overlooks and meeting spaces at numerous, numerous locations, which we'll go into more detail shortly. And the span arrangement provides structural continuity that minimizes the overall structure depth and limits the number of roadway deck joints, making for a smoother ride and reducing overall future maintenance costs. From below, this structure is able to accommodate a new 30-inch water main uh, to be housed below deck and between girders, eliminating impacts to the bridge aesthetic while also providing additional redundancy to utility infrastructure. The pier configuration is designed to increase clearance between piers. This creates opportunities to expand some of the major rowing events held along the stretch of the Merrimack. As you can see in the lower graphic on screen, the regatta rowing course is able to expand from the existing six lane configuration to a nine lane course. 
And with that, now I'll hand it over to Etty, who'll discuss some of the architectural aspects of this project. Hi, my name is Eti Padmoti Putro, and I am from Urban Idea Lab. I'm doing both the architecture and the urban design. Uh, we feel very strongly that it is important to understand the Rohr Bridge in the context of other bridges, as you can see here. Unlike the bridges in the downtown area, the Rohr Bridge stands on its own and is located in a much more natural setting. It is also located in a straight stretch of the river, which is one of the most premier venues in the country for rowing. This new Rohr Bridge is in the perfect location for viewing the boats passing below. Next. This bridge is located in an area that provides long panoramic views. It is an opportunity not only to view out from the bridge, but also to see the bridge from the surrounding area. The fact that this bridge is set at an angle adds to the unique quality and making it an iconic bridge. And that has guided us in our design approach. As Sean mentioned, this bridge has two lanes on each direction. The space for pedestrian and bicyclists are on the outer edges. Taking inspiration from the river, look at the insert, ins, inserts. We use the form of the waves for the observation area, both horizontally as well as vertically. Vertically, we added a back trellis to create a sense of separation and increase the comfort and safety while at the observation area. This waveform also creates an interesting vertical pattern that can be seen from afar. The observation deck is sized to be comfortable to accommodate different users enjoying the space. It is important that these spaces are big enough to maintain flow while not interfering with the people stopping to enjoy the views. These diagram shows the various width along the bridge. On the bottom right, we use the trellis motif to form a missile barrier over the railroad track. We want to ensure that all the elements on the bridge are all completely integrated. On the observation overlook, the vertical trellis can be used in a variety of ways, including an art installations, historical references of the area, such as the mill and other uses. We want the bridge to be distinctive, not just during the day, but also at night. We are collaborating closely with Domingo to develop a bridge that is also iconic at night. Okay, the following sets of images shows the bridge from various points of views. We use this as a tool in developing our design and to quickly analyze the aesthetic quality from various angles. This is just simple plans showing uh, closer to the observation area. Yes, and now it's the oblique to see how how the observation area look uh, next to the uh, road, the vehicular uh, lanes. 
here shows how, how easy it is for people to go behind while other people are sitting and enjoying the observation deck. Next. And here you can see how the bridge can be seen when, when you're basically on the boat going through the bridge. We want to make sure that it's very transparent also on the piers. That's why the piers are, are um, you know, singular piers. And here it is very important that not only where the deck is, but also how the underside is being treated. Because as you know, this is going to be a lot of boats going underneath it. Now, these are just different uh, examples that we use to, uh, to explore what we want to do in terms of uh, railings as well as um, the fencing. Uh, next. And another thing that we would love to do on the next level would be to make sure we can integrate the signage and interpretive panels because Lowell is a very his historic area, and we want to make sure there is a way to start telling the story um, about the area and about the city and maybe about the bridge and the river itself. And I think now I'm going to uh, give it out to Domingo. Please take it away, Domingo. Thank you. Thank you, Eddie. Um, okay, I'm Domingo Gonzalez. Our firm is Domingo Gonzalez Associates, and we've worked on many bridge lighting projects. And on this unique project, the lighting ideas span safety and security, but also touch upon aesthetic and user enhancements. <clears throat> From the point of view of safety and security, this speaks to the lighting of the roadway, the illumination of the roadway, and the lighting of the shared use path. And a very straightforward and economical way of approaching this would be to locate poles either on the road barrier or outboard of the railing to light both the roadway and the shared use path. So, if we can go to the next slide. This cross section is a, very, <clears throat> is a very good illustration of how these ideas start to work with each other. So coming from the roadway barrier, there is a tall pole at the top of that pole is fitted a luminaire to light the roadway. All lighting is dark sky compliant. And then at a lower elevation on the same pole would be a luminaire mounted uh, in the opposite direction to illuminate the shared use path. <coughs> the lighting studies that our staff have done demonstrate that we need all uh, salient roadway illumination criteria and for, for both light level and uniformity. And as I said before, every, all solutions are dark sky compliant and highly energy efficient because they are based on the use of LED technologies. What this cross section also helps illustrate is the, uh, some of the aesthetic lighting ideas. Starting at the, at the left-hand side, we have a continuous light source at, sorry, we have a continuous light source for the, for the illumination of the fascia girder. This fascia girder would, the lighting approach would be RGBW, which stands for red, blue, green, and white, which would be color changing. And we take the same approach for the lighting of the hammerhead girders that sit atop the piers. If we can go to the next slide. This slide it illustrates 
the alternative approach to lighting to lighting the roadway and shared use path with light poles outboard of the railing, but the same approach is taken for aesthetic lighting, both of the fascia girder and the hammerhead girders. Our fundamental uh, strategy for the aesthetic lighting of the bridge is that every night is white, except when we have special events, holidays like Valentine's Day coming up next week, where the RGBW technology allows us to easily change color. If we could go to the next slide. These, Im <coughs> these images illustrate what could be done with a color changing approach. We could address breast cancer awareness or Mother's Day in pink, St. Patrick's Day in March in green, Valentine's Day next week in, in red, or Police Memorial Day in blue. Uh, the Empire State Building has about 100 different uh, appearances for use in any given year. Uh, we would recommend for the Lowell Work Ridge that maybe 12 to 18, 16 to 20 alternative presets might be more than adequate. Next slide. With, with consideration of the overlooks, we have some uh, techniques at our disposal that we can use to make the overlooks, uh, to enhance them, because we would like not to light the overlooks with poles, but rather with more pedestrian friendly, pedestrian scaled approaches. One of those approaches would be the integration of a continuous handrail light at the overlooks themselves. Another consideration, if we can go to the next slide, Would it be possible to go to the, ah, thank you. At <clears throat> another tactic to take would be the enhancement of the proposed seating at the overlooks with via the use of under bench lighting. And then I think we just have one more slide. This slide illustrates uh, or contains many of the ideas and shows how they would work together. First of all, light poles are kept at a distance from the overlook. We see in the upper left hand image, a continuous handrail that transitions into a continuous illuminated handrail at the overlook only. The under, the under bench lighting that I referenced in the slide previously and if we go to the lower left-hand image, <clears throat> we see a potential treatment of the trellis structure that Eddie was talking about, where the missile barrier screen might be a stainless steel mesh. If that is the case, we would love to highlight that mesh uh, via the use of a concealed LED downlight source. At the lower right-hand view, we see a cross-section which sort of ties all the ideas together. Starting from the left, we see the lighting of the trellis missile screen, then the lighting of the underbench, the lighting of the handrail condition, and, and at the curved gullet of the extension of the fascia girder, we see the continuous RBGW luminaire, which would help tear that gullet and the fascia girder different colors when so desired. And now I will give this back to Steve. Thank you, Domingo. Next slide, please. So how do we get this built? Uh, in this pretty busy slide that you see here, um, we've still got some work to do. 
Uh, we are at the preliminary design right now. In March, at the end of March, we plan on having the 25% design. And then we'll do some right-of-way procurement and some environmental permitting, what, what we have to. Uh, and then we'll start a procurement process for a design build. Then we'll actually start construction. Um, we do anticipate the project uh, to be complete, ribbon cutting complete in 2028. And this projected time hasn't changed for over a year with us on our schedule, maybe a little longer. Um, again, there's still work to do. What we want to do tonight is hear your comments about bicycles and pedestrians, uh, the bridge type and landscape and architecture and lighting, all the physical elements that you'll see when you um, experience the bridge. Um, the funding for the bridge, about $170 million. We have secured it with the help of your delegation. Uh, we appreciate that. Um, next slide, please. This is similar to what I just showed you. It, it drills down a little bit more. Um, January of 23, a couple of weeks ago, we had a working group meeting. We've met with our working group several times now. There are um, local officials and advocates uh, who can help us drill down in some of the design details and elements. Uh, it's a sounding off board that we've been using. Our preliminary design or 25% design, again, is due um, in March of this year. We'd like to have a design public hearing in July of this year. Um, and then following that, we'll start with our environmental permitting and our right-of-way acquisition. And then we'll um, start the design build process. Next slide, please. So um, we are going to open it up for public comment. And again, we'll answer questions to the extent that we are able. Um, I think... Uh, Roy, you're going to talk about the uh, the rules by, ahead of time. And before I do that, I would like to acknowledge that um, we have somebody from Congresswoman Trahan's office, and I believe Senator Kennedy is here, and somebody from Rady, Representative Rady Mann's office uh, and the Lowell City Manager are all here. Um, at this time, would any of you like to identify yourself or have something to say? Uh, if not, we can continue on. Uh, yes, I also just want to add, if you have something that you would like to say as a public official, um, please just raise your hands and then once again, just type your um, title in the in the Q&A just so people know who's speaking. Or you can just state your name before you speak. And, and if at any time you have something, uh, I, any of you have something to say, just let us know. Yeah, uh, we actually have a raised hand. Uh, Senator Kennedy, you should be able to speak now. You can unmute your mic. I won't ask the same questions that I asked last week at the um, the meeting that we had last week, but I, I just want to say, uh, because this is a public meeting, that I, I think it's great that you're doing this, uh, that you're having this meeting, and, and I'm very happy with the progress that's been made on the bridge so far, uh, but um, like everybody else in the Lowell area, uh, the sooner the better. I think well, we can't wait for this bridge to get uh, to get up and and get running. So, but thank you very much. I'm really impressed with the with this presentation. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Senator Kennedy. Okay. All right. Um, I currently don't see any more public official raised hands. So I will go over the Q&A instruction. So for question and comments, uh, please use the raise your hand icon to be unmuted for verbal questions. 
Uh, to ask a typed question, please use the Q&A button to submit your question and comments. Uh, please state your name before your question. Please share only one question at a time, limited to two minutes to allow others to participate. To ask a question via phone, dial star nine and the moderator will call out the last four digits of your, of your phone number and on mute your audio when it is your turn. Also, please take a few minutes to complete the survey after the meeting to let us know how your experience was with this virtual hearing. All questions and comments are subject to disclosure for public records. Please use these functions for project related business only. Thank you. Um, I currently see some raised hands, so I will start going through the chat, uh, going through the list. Uh, Alan Saba, you should have permission to speak. Please unmute your mic so you can answer, ask your question. Yes, good evening. Thank you very much for doing this. Um, as uh, Mr. Kennedy said, it is it is long overdue and we, we can't wait in the Lowell area. I have a question. Um, I, I'm a bicyclist and I ride my bike to work every day. I don't cross the bridge, but I've lived in the area all my life. And I guess my, my question is, um, it, if I'm to understand, they went through the slides at the beginning of the show, uh, the presentation pretty quick, and I couldn't quite follow. Is the plan to go through with a, a four lane each way, a two foot buffer and a 15 foot shared space? Is, is that in, in with, with also the overlook pieces on the bridge too? Is that, is that, is that the plan? Let, let, let's go to the cross section, please, that shows it that um, Dan Barboza showed early on. I think it was one of the first slides. And yeah, I'm sorry, it, it went too quick for me. <laughs> that's okay. It's two lanes in each direction where you see northbound and southbound. Uh, it says two lanes there. It's two lanes in each direction. So it'll be a four yeah. lane bridge. Um, those outside lanes are really auxiliary lanes. They work as um, turning lanes when you get to the intersections predominantly. Um, and then there's a, a bike lane and a sidewalk on each side of the bridge and separating the two are a, a painted area for separation. Okay, the re and the reason I ask is we've, we, I, I've lived here all my life. I've, I've lived a half a mile from the bridge all my life. And my daughter has been involved in rowing all her life when she was in school. This, this bridge, this area that it, it on the northbound side, um, it, it's going to, it generates in some of these events, upwards of 10 and 15,000 people. And I know that the overlook won't even be available. They're going to span that bridge from one side to the other. Um, I, I, and I'm not looking to change anything. I'm just kind of disappointed that a bike lane or a walk lane is not separate from where somebody could walk 10 feet onto the bridge and stand and look through. Do you, know, do you understand what I'm saying? I, I, there's going to be a span of people from Wood Street to Old Ferry Road, almost all the way across on any one of these events. And they host a dozen of them a year. It, I think on those special events, um, the bridge will be treated a little differently than on a standard Monday to Friday during commuting time. Um, and well, I guess what I can say is what a what a good problem to have that there are so many people out here looking at the bridge um, and the rowing community hopefully will be enhanced. It's uh, my understanding that we're able to get an Olympic sized course for rowers under the bridge. Um, and that's something that we are pretty excited about. Um, I don't know if there are or what we have in Massachusetts so far, but um, this is a good opportunity. So um, there's only so much room that we have to, to put in a bike lane and a sidewalk. And the, the bridge itself, there's only so much width that we want to get. Um, I, I think during those events, we'll figure out what we can do uh, for bicyclists and, and motor vehicles during that time. Are there any other questions? Uh, thank you, Steve, for your for your answer and Alan will take your concern seriously. Um, Hung, I'll transition to you to read out some of the Q&A questions. Thank you. Sorry about that. Got my 
microphone muted on the left side. Um, there have been some general questions regarding minimizing um, the con uh, existing uh, bridge, whether or not it will be open during construction, and when will we be seeing the new bridge being open to the general public? So we um, plan on keeping the existing bridge open throughout construction. Uh, this bridge, the permanent bridge, um, is mostly off alignment, meaning we can do the vast majority of the work without talk, without touching the existing bridge, really only at the terminus on the south side where there's a little bit of interface. Uh, and that's a short period of time where they'll be tying where we'll be tying the two together. Outside of that, um, the vast majority of the construction will be offline and there'll be um, no traffic impacts. There's also a question about um, traffic uh, during con uh, construction as well. How would that be managed? Um, it, it, the, really the same. So during construction, traffic will be on the existing bridge um, completely. This bridge will be built almost completely offline. Great. Um, there is a question from Anonymous uh, saying that it's an excellent presentation. Uh, that person has a question regarding bicycle accommodation on the north side of Pawtucket Boulevard. A multi-use path is, diff is great uh, for recreational cycling. Uh, but will bicycle travel still be available on the road uh, for those who cycle for commuting uh, slash transportation? Bicyclists will not be prohibited from using the travel lane. And there are some questions regarding uh, lighting. Um, Steve Albert uh, asked, uh, could we sync up lighting patterns with what we currently um, have on the other bridges? That's a, a good question. Um, let, let's um, look into that. I don't have the answer tonight, uh, but it is something we'll look into. Uh, another person who is anonymous uh, asked, will there be an emergency calling telephone in case is needed either at the end of the bridge or between both ways? This actually came up last week and it is something that we are looking into. It's my understanding that University Avenue uh, does have emergency call boxes. Um, so it's something that we'll look into on who we would link to, whether it's the University police, the Lowell police, or, or both, um, it's something we're looking into. And a question relating to, uh, with safety as a whole, uh, Judith uh, Durat asked about the solar panel and the powering of the lighting. Uh, would it be solar panels powering those lighting that we asked or indicated earlier? Domingo, do you yes. know if, um, do we ever use solar panels for this type of lighting? Has technology reached that level yet? <clears throat> uh, it would be an interesting thing to explore. We uh, just finished phase one of the walkway over the Hudson, where the walkway is lit with solar powered lighting. Uh, it brings with it its own challenges. Uh, it's certainly something that we could discuss. We will look into it. Great. With that, I'll transfer over to Roy. Thank you, Hong. Uh, our next question is from Tracy Brinson. How tall are the buildings? Railings. Railings, uh, my bad. Railings. Okay. Uh, 42 inches, generally. Um, the trellises would be substantially higher. The trellises are more of an architectural detail. The railings are for pedestrian rail. They're about 42 inches tall. Thank you, Steve. Uh, we'll transition over to race hands. Our, I'll give Luisa Varum permission to speak. 
Alicia, uh, Louisa, you should be able to unmute your mic. Yes, uh, Louisa Varnum, I'm chair of the Lowell Conservation Commission. And at one of the prior meetings uh, a year or two ago, I expressed uh, concern about the uh, ancient oak trees, which are located on the banks of the north side of the river to the west of the current bridge, and they appear to be to the east of the proposed. I've seen too many projects where they completely clear an area before they start construction. And I would like to see these trees uh, saved, designated on the plans as to be protected. And they certainly uh, are close to where the original ferry crossed the river, uh, thus the name of Old Ferry Road, and certainly are part of our history. They must be, I would guess that they could be as, as old as a couple hundred years. And there are two, three or four of them right there that you can't miss. And uh, I think this is, this is an, a feature that's worth saving and uh, certainly would add some uh, aspect of, of landscape architecture to the finished new bridge. Um, no doubt, let's um, put them on the plans and um, we will do everything that we can uh, to save them. There's, uh, we'll certainly look into it and we'll make sure that they're on the plans. And uh, when we come back at a 25% design, we should have that resolved by then. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Lisa, for your concern. Um, I'm now gonna give Robert Acton Jr. permission to speak. Uh, Robert, you should be able to unmute your mic now. Okay, thank you. Uh, Robert Atkinson, Jr. Uh, I graduated from uh, UMass Lowell in 1984 when this bridge was built. And it was supposed to be temporary, but 39 years is awfully permanent to me. Uh, but anyway, I have a couple issues regarding the vehicular design. First, uh, my concern is um, any plantings at either, at either abutment not interfere with sight distances for turning traffic. I see way too often many um, medians that have plantings maintained by private entities, businesses. They put plantings so high that you can't see the approaching traffic. So just keep that in mind. I drive a Miata, so I'm a little strange. I don't drive an SUV that sits 10 feet off the ground. So I'm about as low to the ground as you can get. So that's a concern. Uh, the only other issue I noted is that the lanes for traffic are 11 feet, whereas the standard, inter uh, standard width for an, a highway lane under federal highway regulations is 12 feet. Why was that selected? I assume it was a cost and space issue, but uh, uh, why the undersized lanes and any chance you could go to a standard 12 foot travel lane? So... I appreciate your comment um, and to address it, um, thank you for the comment on the trees and plantings. Um, for the travel lane, generally our standard is uh, for interstates, we use 12 foot lanes and for other roads, we use 11. This isn't an interstate. Um, and we want to pick a, a lane that is an appropriate width. We don't want to make it too wide. Um, and then we can put that space toward other uses as well on the bridge. It's not necessarily a cost savings idea. It's more of an appropriate design is how we're looking at it. And so on non-interstate, we've over the last several years, we've gone to 11 foot lanes. Thank you, Steve, for your answer, and thanks. thank you for voicing your concern. Robert, um, our next question will be coming from Bree Sullivan. Bree, you should be able to unmute your mic now. Thank you, Roy. 
as Rory said, I'm Bree Sullivan. I am actually here in my official capacity as Chief Civil Engineer and Project Manager for um, a uh, project we're doing at the Collegiate Charter School of Lowell, which is in the southwest quadrant of the bridge, of the existing and proposed bridge. Um, I'm with Gale Associates, and we are doing a synthetic turf field conversion for the Collegiate Charter School, um, what appears to be directly adjacent to the Southwest abutment, the proposed Southwest abutment. So my, my concern is, and um, I think my question was sort of answered in the timeline, is um, what type of impacts do we need to be considering at this point in our design phase um, the school would like to construct the uh, field this summer. Um, at the latest, it'll be this fall. So um, we really want to get a handle on any sort of temporary or permanent impacts that will uh, affect our design. We, uh, we plan to build right up to that lot line, the common lot line. Um, and the other thing that we noticed with the plan is, is that the state highway layout in that area um, does not seem to agree with uh, the lot line at the Collegiate Charter School. Well, I think it was resolved um, as uh, in the past, but um, that's something else that I want you to be aware of that needs to be resolved. Well, thank you, Bree, for um, bringing us up to that. Uh, is there a site plan available for the charter school? Um, are, you have a, are you a pre site plan? Just where are you in the design phase? We're right at schematic design now, which, which in Mass DOT terms, I used to do work as a, as a consultant for Mass DOT prior to my role, uh, is probably 25% at this point. Um, we anticipate being through full design in a couple of months, though. So it's a pretty rapid design schedule. Fair enough. Um, I, I think it's appropriate that we get together and we look at your site plan and, and we see what, what we can do. Okay, that and sounds great. Okay, so we'll 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 be in touch if you don't hear from us directly, um, or if you can leave your number with us or a contact info, um, that would be excellent. Okay, I will do that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to move over to the Q and A session. Uh, there's a lot of people here uh, right now. That's about like 120 people in attendance, and with 38 uh, questions in the queue. I'm going to move to Carl uh, Papalo. Uh, how high above the water is the road surface, and will that affect the safety requirements of the railings on the pedestrian pathways, e.g. cages instead of railings? Okay. Uh, I did say that uh, railings are 42 inches. The area over the railroad will have um, a much larger rail. It's called an anti-missile fence. And that's only the areas over the railroad were required to put that in. Uh, you won't, we don't, we're not expecting um, flooding of the railing or anything like that of the pedestrian railing. And we're uh, above the 100 year flood. Um, do you know, uh, Sean, how much freeboard we have? We, we vary approximately from, say, 25 feet to water at the south. Uh, to about eight feet at the north end. Well, the north end is the tightest uh, uh, yeah. just because of the elevations of the roadway. Um, so we're, we're about eight feet above. And is that the 50 year event or do, do you recall? That's that's two ordinary high water. Our freeboard at 50 years, two years, uh, two feet above freeboard. Okay. Yeah. So the, the bottom of the bridge is two feet above the water level. That's calculated for a 50 year event. So. Thank you. Uh, from Eden Paradise, uh, can you detail the on off lane uh, assignments for each side of the new bridge? Uh, I.e., heading north, right lane is only left turn or straight lane left. So we, we can, um, we have a, a, a slide talking about the northern part of the bridge we find that and jonathan are you here i am indeed can you talk about the northern side intersection 
Yep, northern is actually the same as southern. So as we come off the bridge in either direction, we have three lanes um, instead of it opens up from two lanes to three lanes. Um, the extra lane is for a right turn lane movement. And then there the leftmost lane becomes a left turn lane and the center or right lane on the bridge becomes a through lane. Okay. And it's the same for northbound and southbound as they approach Pawtucket and Middlesex. For, for this slide deck, um, go down to the bottom of the slide deck, way past 25. Oh, slow down. Keep going. So it's probably, if the deck goes to number 64, let's go down to 64, please. Backup slide, that's it, 62. So just for context, yep, Jonathan, yep, do you want to repeat that? Yep, this doesn't have the, the additional lane fully detailed out um, for the left turn here because uh, we're you know we're still building out the the, uh, the intersection. But essentially, we will have a, a an additional right turn lane that opens up after you get off the bridge for right turns onto Pawtucket. Then the right lane that is on the bridge continues through onto Old Ferry. And then the leftmost lane becomes a left turn lane to turn on to Pawtucket going west. And if you were to reverse yourself and look at Middlesex, it would be the same configuration on the other end of the bridge. Thank you. And can we go back to the Q&A slide? Thank you. Thank you. Um, there should be a slide where you can submit your comments. Can we advance to that slide? Here we are. This is one. Yep. So just want to uh, refresh people. Uh, if you are looking for general information, please visit our website with the URL uh, you see on the screen. If you'd like to uh, submit any comments, uh, please use the Pima uh, link that you see on here. Or if you'd like to submit a written comment uh, to us, uh, please uh, write uh, your comments and your questions uh, to the mailing address uh, with uh, Carrie Laval, uh, PE Chief Engineer, uh, Suite 6340. Uh, 10 Park Plaza, Boston, Mass, 02116. And with that, I want to uh, go back to the Q&A. There are a couple of questions regarding the aesthetic and maintenance of the bridge or regarding the uh, activation area and um, the bridge in general. Uh, how are we planning on containing trash and would there be any anti graffiti components uh, in the material? So, um... For areas of trash uh, receptacles, right now we don't have any specific plans to put in trash receptacles, mainly for the maintenance of them. Uh, it's something that we can look into and work with community on if that's something um, th the city would like us to do. Um, what was the other, the second part? anti graffiti materials. Oh, yes. It, it, the um, trellises that we're thinking about installing is mostly an architectural detail, and they do provide some buffer for the, um, for the people in the um, outlook areas. Uh, we are looking at anti-graffiti uh, material to make them with. We don't have a response yet specifically, but it's something that's on our radar screen um, on how to address. Or something to Thank you with that. There are several questions regarding the budget and schedule. Uh, the, what is what are our timeline? When are we starting and how much do we cost? So the construction cost, we're looking at $170 million. And that cost is basically all in. Um, that's really um everything to do with the project, everything that you've seen today in, in your presentation. Um, and that is escalated as well uh, a few years out. I got to say it's difficult to be an economist um, with COVID and supply chain and inflation, et cetera. We're doing the best that we can. 
Um, we're not anticipating this number to change. Um, and it does carry us out to what we call the midpoint of construction is where we estimate two. Uh, so barring any economic changes that are drastic, this is the number or scope changes that we, we haven't talked about this evening. Um, this is the number that we're looking at. And then construction, it's about a three and a half year construction. And we're looking at um, second to third quarter of 28 uh, to be complete. So the beginning of 25, at the end of 24 is when actual construction would start. Uh, between then and now, there's the environmental permitting process. There's the right-of-way acquisition process. There's the completing the preliminary design process. And then there's the procurement for the design build entity that will select for the project. Thank you. Um, there is a question uh, regarding the safety uh, of the current bridge and will it be maintained safe uh, until uh, it is taken out of commission? That's our intent. It's safe to drive over now. It does require maintenance on, on occasion. Um, you know, it was um, a plate did come up. Uh, was that last winter? Um, and that is something that we're certainly trying to avoid to make sure that that doesn't happen. Um, and we do have contracts out to, to keep it in good repair. Thank you. Um, there is a question from uh, Kevin Sullivan. Uh, the railing is shown on the outside edges, uh, but won't you also need high anti-missile fence in area over the rail? Yes, yes, we will. I did thought I'd just mention that. Um, so the standard bridge rail over the vast majority of the bridge is 42 inches. The area over the railroad, we have to put in what we call anti-missile fence. Um, we don't want anyone to throw anything over the railroad. That's a code requirement that um, we have to live by. Great. Uh, I, we have a comment from uh, Karen uh, Scammo. I'm, I'm sorry, I first pronounced her last name. She is from uh, the Merrimack River Rolling Association. She said that this, this is a beautiful bridge design and thank you for considering the rollers and um, and one comment about the observation decks. Uh, these should be placed over the racing lines lane uh, for best access uh, to see um, the rollers and take pictures the view uh, showed them mostly over the pier. Sure. Thank you. Um, we do have a question regarding uh, Judy uh, from uh, Judith again. Uh, are pedestrians and bike lanes one way? Bicycles are, pedestrians are not. Am I misspeaking, Dan? Our bicycles are in, we want them to go in one direction and pedestrians are bi-direction? Yeah, that's the intent. Yeah. And is the presentation available to the public? We can post this on our website. How how will you be able to make it safe in terms of people jumping off? How high is uh, will the railing be? The railing is, we're looking at a 42 inch rail. Um, we don't want anybody to jump off the bridge or leave the bridge. Um, we're not designing it so that it'll be the most iconic bridge around for that type of activity to happen. We're sensitive to it. Um, I'm certainly not encouraging it. There's a question for, uh, for Michael Williams. Uh, how has the new market basket changed traffic patterns uh, from the initial study and how 
does that impact the current study design? So we have counted cars again recently to see if the intersection configuration should change. And we're not finding that it should. If it does, we'll let you know at the 25% design. Um, at this time, it's with or without the market basket, the lane configuration would be the same. I have a question about uh, this bridge is going to be used by many more uh, cars uh, than bikes and pedestrians. Do we have any slides to show the traffic uh, configurations uh, at each end of the new bridge? Um, we just did go over the new bridge. So it's, this is um, a little redundant in that we just talked about the, the northern side and that mirrors the southern side. That's the configuration that we showed, except Jonathan did talk about an additional right lane as we're going north off the bridge to the right. Thank you. Yeah, Steve, I'll just I'll just add. We, we we know that the the left turn coming from Pawtucket heading westbound onto the bridge southbound is very heavy today. Uh, we expect that it will continue to be in the future, and that's why we're showing a dual left turn lane heading onto the bridge. I appreciate that clarification, Jonathan. Thanks, Steve, for the uh, answer, and then thank you, Jonathan, for the clarification. Uh, next, we have a question. What is the clearance under the bridge? Will sailboats be able to go under? Would the water pipe interfere? The water pipe it's about i think it's 30 30 inch or 36 inch water main that'll be um into the girders so no that will not interfere um and then the height of the bridge on ordinary high water to the bottom of the girder um sean you just mentioned what that is it changes from side to side depending on where you are on the bridge right <clears throat> at the at the south end where we passed over the rail, that immediate um, height to the water is about 30 feet. And as we get to the north end, it, it dips down to about eight feet as we meet up with Pawtucket. Okay, so um, it depends on how high the mast is, um, but the, the total is about 30 feet of for ordinary high water, um, certainly for storms and whatnot, uh, it would be less. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Sean. Uh, I'll now transition to raise hands. Um, Eleanor Casey Crane, I'll give you permission to speak. Uh, you should be able to unmute. Can you hear me? Now. Yep. Yeah, we can hear okay, you. Okay, great. Um, I, I just want to follow up on a question that was asked about the maintenance. Um, we did have a plate that came up. It was over a year ago. A car was actually smoking, um, as it came off the bridge. So I'd specifically like to know what your timeline is on the updated maintenance. Um, if you know when you're going to be doing that maintenance, like in the next six months, three months, I'm, I know that you are in receipt of a letter from our delegation concerning this. Um, so I, I just want more specifically, when are you going to be getting in there and, and fixing that, um, you know, that surface? to maintain it um, like a year or two months. Hi, hey, Steve. This is Brian from District yeah. 4. Thank you, Brian. Hey, no problem. Um, yes, actually, we're going to be uh, advertising a contract. Hopefully, it'll be awarded uh, this spring or early summer where we can uh, start to replace and refurbish some of the deck plates, and we'll be doing that uh, throughout the summer. OK, so you anticipate um, being actually working and and getting that maintenance done this summer yeah we're going to start um doing that work it's going to have to be a phased approach we have to kind of you know take off deck plates and refurbish them and put them back so we're going to be doing that in a kind of a a, a staged approach 
And just uh, one quick other uh, follow up on uh, the safety issues that were mentioned earlier. Um, I mean, it is a serious issue about the railings. Was there any consideration given to making the railings higher um, to prevent, you know, people from trying to jump off? Because obviously, then we're, we're going to have to pay for police detail or something to monitor it if if we had a situation like that. Um, so I'm just wondering if any consideration was given to making the railings. Uh, I mean, I'm like seriously asking, uh, making the railings a little higher. If they were going to be higher, they would be much higher. And it seems that 42 inches is the typical architectural rail that you have elsewhere on bridges in Lowell. Um, so there's uniformity there. And um, I guess we would have to ask why specifically on this bridge? Again, we're not trying to make this one so iconic it, it attracts something like that. Um, and we are trying to be sensitive to the conversation. Thank you, Steve, for your answer. Um, I see Alan Saba has a raised hand. I'll now give you permission to speak. Roy, thank you very much. Um, I'll try to make this brief. I, I'm just envisioning myself crossing it now. Again, as I mentioned in my previous question, I've traveled to bridges all my life here. And the bridge, the O'Donnell Bridge, that's just down the river a bit, has a two-lane exiting both sides. Now, as I'm coming northbound across that bridge, they had road markings for the right lane to go straight and right and the left lane to go westbound on the boulevard. And I know that um, living in the area, I know that they did several traffic detail studies on traffic patterns and the amount of vehicles traveling in that area. Has anything been looked at with regard to, well, I'm sure it has, but to what extent has it been looked at? If I'm coming from Route 3 and I'm coming through Drum Hill and I go to cross over this new bridge, I want to go home. I want to go straight. Um, I want to go up Old Ferry Road. So I'm in the right lane on the bridge, which proceeds up Old Ferry Road. Um, do you envision traffic backing up across this bridge for people that are in either right or left lane and then jumping lanes? Because this happens like all the time on the O'Donnell Bridge to the point where Police officers are stationed in a parking lot on the other side of the bridge, regularly ticketing people. I, I, I just, it's, it's going to be several tens of thousands of vehicles <laughs> crossing this bridge. And I, I appreciate the fact that it's four lanes now, I really do. But has, has, it, has the traffic amount been looked at with regard to this question? We, we've counted cars prior to COVID and then subsequent to COVID, and we have modeled the intersections. Um, there will be times where an intersection may degrade a bit. Um, that happens in any urban environment. Um, frankly, if it didn't, we would have a, there's a lot more infrastructure out there than you'd necessarily need. Um, so there's a balance to strike. Um, it may be that we want to show some simulation, and if we can, at the next hearing, we'll show a simulation of traffic moving through. Um, if we can put something like that together, we'll bring that to a 25% design public hearing. Thank you, Steve. Uh, I see another raised hand in the queue. Uh, Robert Atkinson, Jr., I'll give you permission to speak. Now you should be able to unmute. Yes, Mr. Mr. Atkinson again. Um, instead of a signalized intersection at each end, some of the early concepts showed um, alternatives like roundabouts or some other unique uh, intersection methods that have been tried elsewhere in the country. Has any further study been done to look at alternatives to a signalized intersection to you know, possibly make it safer and improve flow as opposed to turning lanes? 
and things of that nature. Thank you. Steve, I could take that one if you'd Thank like. You. Yes. Maureen Schlebeck with McMahon Associates. Um, we were the traffic lead on the Vork Bridge project. Um, so at each of the intersections at the bridge termini, uh, we did consider a whole host of options in terms of how to address the traffic and lay out the intersection. Um, and what we did is we went through what we call a fatal flaw analysis. So, you know, we started with, you know, maybe eight or 10 alternatives. We narrowed those down to three alternatives that were moved forward for further study. So, for example, at the northern intersection at Pawtucket, we looked at a signalized intersection, a Michigan left turn, and a roundabout concept. Um, those were the three most viable options. And then those options get analyzed on a whole host of metrics. Um, some of which is travel time and delay, volume, how it addresses each of the transportation users, the peds, the bikes, the vehicles, uh, but also the right of way and environmental impacts. Um, so for example, the roundabout was ruled out of those three options because of its impacts to the pedestrians. It requires multiple stage crossings for a pedestrian. Uh, and it also had high right of way and environmental impacts compared to the signalized intersection. Thank you, Maureen. Thank you. Uh, we have a couple questions regarding the rolling lanes. Uh, Jessica Murray, an anonymous person, uh, asked about how wide the lanes are and will uh, construction affect uh, water traffic? The lanes are 11 feet wide, the typical travel lane of which there are four. And during construction, when we put in the piers, um, that particular part of the river will not be traversable, um, but that won't be the case all the time. Uh, it depends on where you are in the river uh, and where you're crossing during construction. All of the piers won't be constructed at the same time. Great, thank you. Uh, Jeff Thomas uh, asked about the, uh, does this bridge fall under any of the federal guidelines as to funding and falling under PLA agreement as to the funding source? Um, I, I'm not sure. What was the PLA? PLA. I do not know what an acronym is as well. I'm, I'm not sure. It might be project labor agreement. I'm not sure. Um, there is no project labor agreement on this. We are subject to Federal guidelines, certainly for design and construction and procurement, and we're subject to state guidelines, rules, and regulations, also environmental laws, mainly a NEPA uh, with an N, um, and the, the Clean Water Act. So. Thank you. Uh, Jeff, if, if that did not answer your question, uh, if you can clarify that uh, as a follow-up question, that, that would help us uh, answer your question that you're asking. Uh, Steve uh, Albert asked, uh, will the Pawtucket Vell River Walk uh, be extended to the new landing follow up? Uh, how will bike and pedestrian traffic be worked in to flow on the Middlesex Street side? I'm not sure how far away that is. That's something we'll have to look into on a connectivity. Um, generally, our construction is related to the corridor of the bridge and a little bit on either side to get to um, the park on, on either side and then toward the old abutment where that will be for the existing bridge. Um, that's an area that, that we'll have construction in and our pathway system will go that far. It's not going much farther, uh, but we can look at it to see. Uh, there's a question about uh, the affordance for the vehicle, emergency vehicles uh, by only, is, is it going to be affected uh, if we're going to only, only go uh, with four lanes? Well, right now there are one lane in each direction and we're putting in two lanes in each direction. And for an emergency vehicle with their lights on, et cetera, um, they should be able to cross significantly better than they do today. Uh, and I know today there's a, a there are issues, but um, we, we think the travel time is significantly better. 
Great. Uh, Bru, um, Bright, um, Brighton uh, asked, and I apologize if I <laughs> got your name wrong. Uh, what is the starting uh, point on the south side and the starting point on the north side? I'm not sure what, but I guess it's uh, regarding to landing of the bridge. Uh, for, the, for the construction, do we have the limits in a graphic here? Um, we do. I don't remember what slide number it is. It might be one of Eddie's. Or that, that one right there, number eight. That works as well, too. So, well, we go to a little north of Old Ferry Road. Right. So um, if there's a cursor just a little north of Old Ferry Road and then where the old bridge abutment is, um, we have to remove the uh, abutment unless somebody would like us to keep the abutment in the pier for some future use. Um, but the construction will be in, in that area. And then to the south of the bridge, um, the intersection, we're we going a, a couple hundred feet. Jonathan, roadway wise? We should have a. That, that's about right, to Middlesex. To Middlesex. And, and we should and have. Just, and then just across Wood Street a little bit. Yeah. Um, we, we should, I apologize, we should have a graphic that shows the limit to the south uh, and to the north. We will make sure that we do that in July when we come back. Um, there's a question for, uh, from right. Lori uh, Elliott. Uh, it was stated a vast majority of the work will be done without impact, uh, except for the tie-in. How long do you anticipate the tie-in to take? It, it's something that we're working on. Um, I don't know if it's hours or days, but it's it's not significant for the amount of work that we're doing on a major river crossing such as this. Um, I think we'll be able to tie that down as we go forward a bit. We are clearly, as we're showing, uh, this bridge is offline. And at some point, we have to tie the bridge down to the intersections. So there is. Um, realistically some impact during construction um, and we are trying to minimize it. Uh, we'll, we'll find out if we're hours or days and we'll get back to you. We'll, we can talk about that at the 25% design and we're anticipating that to be in July. Great. Um, that's a question from MO. Uh, there um, any plans, are there any plans of elevating the look and the feel of the area around the bridge, like adding seatings and overlook? Yes. Um, right now there are six overlooks on the bridge um, with benches at each of the overlooks. Three on each side right now is the configuration that we're having. Great. And with that, uh, from Amy, who is going to be responsible for, for maintaining um, the landscaping? Um, it, it will be a combination. Um, some may come to the city if it's on city property. Some may be DCR if it's DCR property. And then some MassDOT uh, on the MassDOT, but generally we have the bridge and not a whole lot else. Thank you. Um, from the owner. And then a uh, question from Tracy uh, Bernson. Uh, any chance the right turn lane uh, can start mid bridge instead of just at the end? We don't think we need to. Okay. Uh, Kevin Sullivan uh, asked, will the new peers uh, end up in the center of the old bridge or something like that. So bore race lanes uh, will be in 
interrupt interpret it? Interrupt. Interrupt? Sorry, thanks. Um we'll have to look at the sequence of construction for racing while the bridge is under construction. I don't know that we have it drilled down that much. We did configure the piers such that we can have a better rowing course for the long term. While it's under construction, we'll have to look into how it will be impacted at the site of the bridge. Thank you. Uh, Thomas uh, Hickman uh, asked, presently uh, on the north side, pedestrian can walk uh, under the bridge without crossing the road. Will this still be possible on the new path? Jonathan. You. Yep. So um, initially we looked at having a, a, a crossing similar to what's at the existing bridge today going underneath. We, we recognize that crossing an intersection is less pleasant than walking directly underneath the bridge um, to the other side. Um, the big constraint with that, just like the one today, is that the river floods and it's flooding more often. And the elevation of that, um, that crossing underneath the bridge, um, in order to also connect to Old Ferry, without having significant impacts to that intersection and the properties around it um, would require that path to be very low. So it would flood more often than it would be available. Um, with every flooding also comes the muck and uh, damage to lighting that would have to be under there and, and all kinds of other things. So based on that and the fact that the intersection itself now has a safe pedestrian crossing from one side of the bridge to the other, which the current one does not. Um, it was removed from the design. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, our next question, since you have shown the proposed layout, have you already begun land acquisition right of way negotiations with the affected landowners? We have not. Um, we're still working on the preliminary design and that land acquisition really wouldn't start until after a design public hearing. And that would be, we're looking at July. Okay, thank you, Steve. How will traffic congestion be handled when people entering slash leaving the new Rourke Bridge onto Old Ferry Road? I think we've talked about it already um and we've shown the configuration and we talked about the right lane the through lane and the left lane okay my apologies must have reread that question uh next question is can anyone give the status of the roundabout that was planned on the room side of the old ferry road is that still part of the overall traffic flow plan as a local resident who goes to that intersection several times a day it seems to be working okay as is, but traffic patterns will change the new bridge. Yeah, Steve, I, I can take that one. Okay. So uh, a roundabout at Old Ferry Road and Varnum Road was considered, I believe, as part of the market basket mitigation. Um, and and uh, my understanding of their mitigation package is that they were gonna do a post opening traffic study, you know, once they were settled in and, um, evaluate that intersection. That roundabout was not proposed as part of the bridge project. It was part of the market basket mitigation. Thank you, Maureen. Um, our next question is from Amy. It's hard sometimes to take a left out of market basket parking lot onto Old Ferry to get to Pawtucket. With traffic flowing right into Old Ferry, it's going to be impossible. Is this being addressed in some way? Yeah, again, I, I can speak to that. So when we when we studied the traffic volumes at the intersections, um, we did look at projections, 20 year projections, and we superimposed the market basket traffic on top of it. And then we designed our intersections to meet those traffic demands. Um, so 
you know, there probably will still be delays coming out of the market basket driveway, but when you get to Pawtucket Ave, that intersection is designed to handle the traffic that's coming at it, including the market basket traffic. Thank you very much, Maureen. Um, we currently right now have no raised hands or Q and A's in the queue. Um, could you please bring up the contact page once again? Thank you. Uh, yeah, so for general information, please look at the project site. If you wanna leave a question and comment after this hearing, please uh, use the following site. The QR code will redirect you. Actually, another question just came up in the Q&A. Uh, this question is from Carl Popolo. Slide 38, is there no physical barrier between the opposing traffic lanes? Is that intentional? There isn't any um, barrier between the two lanes in the middle of the bridge. Um, we're using a double yellow central line, which is what we use for many areas with this type of volume and this type of design speed. It, and it, it does work. Um, and it does allow emergency vehicles to cross if they have to as well without having a separation there. Uh, so no, we're, we're not planning on a barrier down the middle of the bridge. Thank you, Steve. Uh, we've also got a raised hand uh, from Jessica Murray. Jessica, I just gave you permission to unmute. You should be able to speak. <clears throat> Hi, my name's Jessica Murray. I am uh, part of the rowing community. I was just wondering if you could speak a little bit more to how far away the bridge abutments are in the river um, and like the space between as far as like the rowing course. I'd have I can, to get back. I can speak to this a little bit, Steve. The, Thank you. The, the layout that we have right now, we've got a little over 150 feet to between, you know, clear between each of the piers. So this basically allows for rowing lanes that are uh, 45 foot wide from what we understand that's the Olympic rowing course, um, you know, criteria, you know, that we've been given from the rowing community. So that that's what allowed us to, we, we made sure we coordinated the pier clear widths with the, the lane width that were needed for the course to maximize the, the number of lanes. Yep, that's it, perfect on the screen. And those dimensions, Sean, those are about between the piers. Did you say they were 45 feet or so? Uh, each each of the rowing lanes as they're laid out there are a little over 45 feet. The piers themselves are about 150 foot clear. Right. Thank you, Sean and Steve. Um, our next question, expected speed limit over the bridge. Um, we don't at all want anyone to speed. Um, the it's it's always difficult to um, post the speed and to talk about the posted speed beforehand. I'm thinking it'll be about 25 miles an hour. Uh, do you know, Jonathan, what the curve? is for is it 25 or 30 what the yep, design so, it is yeah so so the, the the intention for for this is to have a design speed of, of for the roadway that encourages drivers to go somewhere between 25 and 30 miles an hour uh, whether or not it gets posted to that or sits at the statutory speed of the city of lowell um, it's too early to speak to that. So it, it seems that it would be 25 or 30 in that range is the intent. Or, and um, if we go lower than that, it becomes artificial and um, it's difficult to drive at that. Thank you, Steve and Jonathan. 
Uh, could you please transition once again to the contact page? Uh, yes, I just also want to let it be known. Uh, you can use a QR code or keep note of the uh, general information site that we will have the presentation listed there uh, after this hearing. Um, and also we will have a survey sent out. Uh, please fill it out. We do appreciate your feedback. Uh, we just got another question from Jessica Murray. What is the expected timeline for travel under the bridge to be stopped for the regator course? under the bridge. So I, I'm struggling to respond to the question. Um, travel under the bridge would be rowing traffic, if you will. Um, and the timeline for it to be stopped, I guess it would depend on the event. I am um, at a loss to respond, and I apologize. Unless it's um, during construction, and somebody did ask, um, we don't have those details yet during construction um, for those larger events that you are going to have. It's something we are going to work on, and when we come back in July, uh, we hope to have a um, better time frame for it during construction. We did focus on the long term for the location of the piers so that you could have an Olympic-sized course uh, post-construction, but during construction, we'll get back to you. Thank you, Steve. Uh, we have another question from Chris McBlain, I understand your concern for flooding. However, by some of the comments made this evening, it is evident that you've not experienced a weekend event on the boulevard and even sat in traffic to understand why some of these questions are being asked. I don't believe from your answers that you're fully briefed on UML's rowing team or the events or festivals that take place, but please become more knowledgeable about the area and the city. Thank you. Well noted, I appreciate that. Thank you for your comment, Chris. Um, as of right now, there's no questions in the Q&A or any raised hands. We'll give it a moment and see if we have any, any, any further questions come in. So while we're waiting, again, to recap, we are Taking all of your comments under advisement tonight, sincerely, and um, we're developing a 25% design plan, and we plan on presenting that to you ideally in July, um, and hopefully we'll, we'll have more then where we're a little better off. Eventually, we'll go to right-of-way acquisition, our permitting for the project, and then we'll do um, design build team selection. Um, and then we'll start the uh, final design and construction process for an eventual ribbon cutting. Thank you, Steve. Uh, we'll give it another minute um, if no other questions or comments are asked. We can close it out.
Uh, just also another reminder, please fill out the Q&A. You'll be receiving that in your email after the hearing is closed tonight. Uh, could you please advance the slide? Um, before we uh, advance the slide, we just got a uh, question from uh, Robert uh, at Kenson. Um, 30 miles speed limit seems low. Uh, would it be possible to have the bridge posted to a more reasonable, like 35 miles per hour? Obviously, uh, an 80th percentile speed study would be the best way to set the posted limit. I, I agree on the um, speed study to post the limit. And there are signals at either side of the uh, bridge. And our intent isn't to make it a, a speedway. And I, I know that, and I'm not saying that yours is Robert either. Uh, it's something that we're looking at. Um, I think we were thinking more at 25 to 30 miles an hour, um, but it is something where we will look at. Thank you. And we got a raise hand from Diana Roy. Uh, yeah, I'll gonna... give her permission to speak. Uh, Diane, you should be able to unmute your mic. Diane? Um, seems, seems as if Diane's not able to unmute. We'll, in the meantime, we'll have Alan ask his question. Yes, um, just a comment and then a question. A comment with regard to the speed. I don't know how the bridge is affected with regard to like say a private street or Vinham Avenue, the city is going forward with a, a plan in the very near future to reduce to make the entire most of the most of the city with with the exceptions of like Pawtucket Boulevard or state highways a 25 mile an hour speed limit. Um, that's been told to us by captains that reside at our council council meetings. I don't know how the bridge is affected by it, but I have one question today and then four years from now, will the same be said if I'm on the boulevard or I'm on Middlesex Street and I'm entering the bridge, it will be a one lane onto the bridge. Is that, is that my understanding? And I apologize if this was covered and I missed it. So, Jonathan, do you have the graphic would be, on the boulevard? You'd have to advance a little farther, I believe. It's in right there, 62, please. Thank you. So I, I'm not sure if you're referring to eastbound or westbound, but both directions have significant improvements from what's connecting to the bridge today. Uh, if you're traveling eastbound, you'll have a right turn lane um, onto the onto the bridge. If you're traveling westbound, there's dual left turn lanes rather than the single left turn lane that very often backs into the existing travel lanes that are for through traffic. Thank you. Uh, Judith uh, Durant uh, said, please consider making both uh, the bicycle and pedestrian lanes uh, one way and not just uh, cycle lanes. As a cyclist, I think this would be safer for both cyclists and walkers. And Steve Albert, uh, that he agrees with the speed limit should be on the load side. Both bridge length is only uh, a fourth of a mile. Uh, no point in making it a dragway. Thank you for your comment. 
And with that, we don't have any more. Um, I Q&A. do see D- Diane still has a raised hand. We could give her one more chance to voice her question. Uh, it seems as though she's no longer present. I also like to uh, take note that our services, such as CART and language interpreters, are uh, coming to an end. So we do have a hard stop soon. And um, we'd like to thank our uh, CART, as, uh, our closed captioning. Uh, as well as our language interpreters for the service tonight. Um, We have a question in the Q&A from Robert Walters. Can you speak to what the phases of construction will look like once construction begin? What is built first, second, et cetera? By and large, the construction will be offline for the bridge. Certainly the the piers have to be built first. And that's all done offline uh, to keep traffic on the existing bridge. There will be times uh, or a time, a small time. And again, I don't know if it's hours or days where we tie in on the south side of the bridge, Uh, but essentially construct a new bridge, tie it into the south. do as much work on the north at the intersections as we can, tie it in, uh, and then open it to traffic, then demolish the existing bridge. Fundamentally um, and logically, that would be the case. We have to decide how prescriptive we want to be with our suggested sequence of construction for when we go to a design build team. There may be efficiencies that the team comes up with um, to get construction faster, which would result in a uh, less expensive project as well. So that's something that we want to work with them on. Clearly, um, impacts to bicycles, pedestrians, and motoring traffic are are important. They have to be minimized. And um, underneath, uh, to boats underneath, we want to minimize impacts. It's all something that we're looking at. We don't have the final details at this point. Um, At our next meeting, we can discuss it. Uh, Even at that time, they won't be the final details, but it'll be a little more detailed than what we're telling you today. And I'm told we need to um, wrap this up. I want to thank you all for coming. We really appreciate it. We will be back ideally in July. Uh, We do have a website. You can leave comments there. You saw the address. You can leave comments with our chief engineer online. Uh, There are a lot of different ways to reach out to us. and We appreciate it. We also like to mention that this uh, public information meeting uh, was advertised in the newspaper advertisement, uh, social media, such as MassDOT, Facebook and Twitter accounts, uh, the Northern Middlesex Council of Government and other outreach uh, from OPEO, uh, the Low uh, RMD Service Center, the Work Opportunities Unlimited, and uh, the Memorial Library, the, the Pollard Memorial Library. So with that, uh, Steve, would you like to close the meeting? Again, thank you all very much. We'll see you in a few months. I declare this hearing closed. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.